I was just told that it's a Wayne White issue, that we're on three different things and one of their things went out. So this is cool though. I mean, you'll still be able to see slides. I won't be able to see you sleeping. It's perfect. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate our worship team. Uh, Improvising on the fly, singing loudly so we can sing along with them. It was really beautiful to hear you sing. It really was. So thank you for continuing to worship despite the fact that um, that the lights are out. Um, good news is the air is still on. So that's... Yeah. Uh, we're in uh, Psalm 145. If you would uh, turn there with me, we're going to read it here in a moment. One of the things that, that I would like to do each week is read this together. Hopefully you're reading it on your own too. Every time I read it, I'm learning something new. I'm learning something different. Um, and, and I'm really, really grateful. This is the part of God's word being living and active that we see lived out when we're reading scripture. That the Holy Spirit continues to show us something deeper, uh, something new, of something that we need to hear in any given moment, and we need to read in any given moment that ministers to us and, and, and makes us realize again and again how, how great God is, that he would still be active in our lives, still ministering to us as individuals, um, and meet us where we are. So... It is a beautiful thing. So before we read, let's pray together. Father, I just thank you so much for the sweet moment of worship that we had. I'm just so thankful, Lord, for the gifts that you've given. I'm thankful, Father, for not only the people who are up front, but all the people who pray. I'm thankful, Father, for the people that are working and have worked and do work with our kids to keep them entertained in the back and, and teach them truth. Um, on their level. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them today. I pray, Father, that you would speak through them so that our kids can learn truth that, that they need to hear. And I pray for us as we listen to your words in here. Help us, God, to be focused on who you are, your power, your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and that we can trust you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Psalm 145, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all his promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and give and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears the cries. 
He hears their cries and he saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. The, the phrase I want us to focus in on is, is the trustworthiness of God. That God is trustworthy. And we see that played out in these verses. I, I, we used to say this phrase to our kids. Did you ever say it to your teenagers? Trust is earned. Our teenagers, are you hearing that from your parents? Okay. Um, we usually had to say this phrase to them when after they had been in trouble and they wanted to go out and be with their friends um, and they wanted us to just trust them. And I would look at them and I'd say, you just, you just hurt that trust. And so now you've got to earn it back. It's kind of what we do. And, and I think that that's important for us to understand that. But we just, I mean, it's hard for us as humans to trust other humans. Especially if those humans have hurt us. Especially if those humans have done something that we didn't appreciate. Am I, am I right about that? Yeah. You're going to have to say yes every once in a while just so I know that you're awake back there. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 118 verse 8 says, It is better to put your trust in the Lord than to trust humans. Can I get an amen from that? Amen. Yeah. I mean, we, we feel that. We feel that. But we need to trust in someone. We need that. We want to know that we can trust our kids. We want to know that we can trust our, our spouses. We want to know that we can trust our friends. If you're working in a, in a factory, don't you want to know that you can trust your coworkers who've got your back? Right? We want to trust. We do. It's just hard to trust people that are fallible. Well, thankfully, God isn't. God is worthy of your trust. Trust in God and commitment to him are often linked together in Scripture. I mean, we can say that we trust God, but do we really? And oftentimes when we look at these words, they, they often appear together. Not every single time that trust is talked about or trust in God is talked about. But here's a couple of examples. Psalm 37, verses 3 to 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. Here's another one. It's Proverbs 3. You probably have memorized it at some point. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So trust in God is linked to commitment to God. Because what is, what is trust if it's not in action? I can tell you that I trust you, but if, but if I don't tell you anything, if I don't share deeper things with you, then, then you probably have figured, you will probably figure out that I don't trust you, right? And the same it is with every human relationship. We can say that we trust God, but are we really going to commit to him in order to show him that we trust him? God is worthy of that trust. And one of the reasons we want to, when we trust people, we want to know that they've proven to be trustworthy. We want to know that they, that they are worthy of that trust. And God has a proven track record. And you don't have to go very far in scripture to see that. Even when Adam and Eve sin, God still looks after them and takes care of them. Even when Cain, after Cain killed his brother. God told Cain that no one was going to harm him. God has earned trust. We can read through that all the way through Scripture. God has kept every single promise that he has ever made. In order to be worthy of someone's trust, you would have to prove to them that they can be trusted. Or they would have to prove to you that they can be trusted. The word faithful appears in our passage here. 
It talks about the faithfulness of God. There in verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways, faithful in all he does. He's trustworthy. He's worthy of the trust. It's someone who fulfills promises, someone who is reliable. And God is reliable. I mean, if, I, if we were to line up and everybody had an opportunity to speak, you could probably come up with at least one time in your life when God showed up. You and I are walking testimonies of God showing up in our life. Of God proving himself to be faithful to us. In a moment when we weren't sure how it was going to work out. Maybe you're in a moment right now where you need to trust God. Maybe you're in a moment right now in a time of life right now where, where you're just not sure what's going to be the end result of what you're going through. And I'm here to tell you that God is with you through it. God's track record of faithfulness speaks for itself. Every single promise that he has made in Scripture has come through, except for the one we wait to be fulfilled when Jesus comes back. Everything else has panned out. Everything. I did a Google search just to see how many promises there are in Scripture. The number ranges from 3,000 to 7,000. But the fact is, it's thousands, and every single one of them is, has been, God has been faithful to fulfill. Psalm 33, verse 4. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. 2 Corinthians 1.20. Paul says, God has made a great many promises, and they are all yes because of what Christ has done. Jesus, the, the prophecies about Jesus alone number in like the 300s, and every single one of those has come true. So that's why Paul makes this statement. They all came through through Christ. So through Christ, we say amen. amen. And we want God to receive the glory. Now, one of the things as humans that, that helps us to build trust with other humans is how they respond to us when we are in need. Will they come alongside of us? Will they pray with us? Will they pray for us? Will they encourage us? Will they say even truth to us if the truth even hurts us? Will they be loving and kind to us? God is one who will respond to your cries for help. And if you, if you look in, in this passage that we've just looked at or just read in Psalm 145, it says in verse 18, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. <coughs> He hears us. He hears what you're going through. He hears the pain that you're feeling. He hears you crying out in the middle of the night. He hears you cry out in the middle of the day. He hears you, and he will respond to you. Now, it may not be in your timing, but he will always respond. In Psalm 18, verse 6, Psalmist says, in my distress, I call out to the Lord. I cried out to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. What's amazing about this psalm is that the psalmist knows that God hears him as an individual. I mean, there are a couple of hundred individuals in here. And God hears every single one of our hearts. He knows exactly what we're going through. Billions of people live in this world, and he would hear them cry out if they did. Psalm 34, verses 17 and 18. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all of their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Every time God responds to us, again, it may not be in our timing. And I wish I could tell you that he could, that he would do it tomorrow, and he might. He might. There you go. Now I can see who's 
sleeping. <laughs> That's just weird. <laughs> I don't know where it's at. Oh, yeah, trust in God. That's right. Trust in God. Trust in God. Um, and, and I wish I could tell you that he would respond tomorrow to whatever need it is that you need him to respond to, but he may not. But again, that's a place where we can trust God. To move in that situation. So as we wait, we trust. That's putting trust and commitment together. That my commitment to God won't change even though I'm waiting for Him to do something. And it takes the strength of the Holy Spirit to do just that. Alex was talking about this this morning, and I feel this. And when he talked about the Holy Spirit adding or changing, turn to Psalm 13 with me. Right here, is that good? <laughs> Psalm, Psalm 13. Oh, I kind of like yelling. <laughs> Read along with me as I read these words of David. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? David is being raw here. He's wondering when God is going to step in. He wants God to step in sooner rather than later. Four times he asks that question, how long? And then, verse 3, look at me and answer me, Lord. Give light to my eyes and I will sleep or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I, will over, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. It's almost like, God, look at me. Look at me when I'm talking to you. In those next verses. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation, and I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. Sometimes the strongest, the strongest testimony that we can give is in our pain. When we rely on God, even when things aren't being healed, even when things aren't going the way we want them to. Sometimes our strongest testimony is, I believe in God anyway. I wish things were different. I wish things would be different, but I trust in God anyway. That's David's testimony. The writer of Psalm 119, verse 50 says, my comfort in my suffering is this. Your promise will preserve my life. So no matter what's happening in this moment, this psalmist believes in the promises of God. And that God will make good on those promises. So God may not respond in your time, but he will respond. And he definitely hears what you need. The other thing that we see in this, in this psalm Psalm 145 um, is how God provides for his people. Um, if, you look at, if you look at verses 14 and following, he says, The Lord upholds all who fall and, and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. And so God is going to step in, and he's going to meet needs. Do you know the top in the top five of most adults for you know what things the adults worry about is providing for my family? The state of our economy, you know, the things that we the job losses, the unemployment rate, whatever. We we worry about these things. We want to provide for our family. That's what we want to be able to do. Even even those who are Retired want to be able to provide for their grandkids and their grandkids when they when they pass away. 
So it becomes one of the top five things that, that adults worry about. You, you know this phrase, where do you see it? On your money. It's interesting, I did a little research on this. A reverend back in 1861, during the Civil War, wrote to the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Salmon, Salmon Ray, uh, Chase, uh, during that time and suggested that this be put on money because it would be a, a, a encouragement to the families that, were, that had lost people. It would be an encouragement to the soldiers who were fighting that they would see this on their money and think, oh yeah, be reminded that, that they can trust in God even in horrific times. And so that was adopted. So then the question I asked to myself was why on the money? And then it occurred to me that that's we see it all the time. We, I mean, we may not see it in your wallet, but we see it in exchanging money, give it away, we save it, look at it, get bills, what we see. During the Civil War, people would have been seeing their coins, and they would have maybe been encouraged by that. It's ironic, really, when you think about that, it's put on our money. Because I think that that's where we struggle sometimes in trusting God and putting the commitment to work. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, Paul says, And my, my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. The Philippian church didn't have a lot. But they supported Paul, and he appreciated it, and reminded them that God was going to meet their needs even in their poverty. We see this happen again. Paul does the same thing when he's writing about giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, chapters 8 and 9. In chapter 9, verse 8, he says that God will be able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Do you see the number of times Paul uses the word all there? What he means is that God was not gonna, is not just going to be half-hearted about this. When, he, when God promises to meet needs, he's going to meet needs. And so in those moments when you're struggling financially, in those moments when you're not sure that, that all of your needs are going to be met, this is where we trust God. This is where we put our trust into action. Where we remain committed to him, even though things don't look great. Giving tithes and offerings is an act of worship. It's also an act of trust. In the Bible, it talks about first fruits. The Old Testament talks about this a lot. And, and first fruits just indicates the things that come out first. So if they're harvest, and they're harvesting, they gave the first apples off the tree, as an example. They gave the first apples off the tree, even though there was no guarantee that other apples would be produced on that tree. But they trusted God to provide for them. It was that way with their grain. It was that way with their livestock. In Genesis chapter 4, we read that Abel takes some of the fat portions from the firstborn of his flock and offers them as a sacrifice to God. There was no guarantee that other lambs would be, would be born during that time, but he gave of the firstborn of his flock, trusting God to provide for him. And that's the way it should be with our giving. It should be a matter of trusting God in it, that God's going to continue to, to provide for me, even though writing this check or giving this money is difficult. I'm trusting that God is going to do something great and going to meet my needs anyway. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, he's talking about an impoverished church. He's talking about impoverished people. He's talking about this collection that's being made. He said, now, now about the collection for the Lord's people, he says, do, do what I told the Galatian churches to do on the first day of the week, each of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. He's talking to an impoverished church with impoverished people and asking them to trust God in their giving. 
and about a different group of impoverished people, about a different group of impoverished churches, he says this in verses 4 and 5 of 2 Corinthians 8. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. And I highlighted the most important part of this for you. They gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. They trusted God in their giving, even in their poverty, he says, they trusted God, and gave themselves first to him, and that allowed them then to be generous. Now maybe they can only give two, three dollars, but that was okay, because it was out of their poverty that they gave. Jesus commends the widow who only gives two pennies, because he says she gave everything that she had, trusting God to provide for her need. In First Chronicles, they are collecting they are collecting things for the temple, for the first temple to be built, that would later be built by Solomon. But David is overseeing the collection. And, and as I read this passage again, I thought this would be a good passage for, for us to pray or read before we write our checks, before we give money to missionaries, before because it's a it's a it's a prayer of trust. And thanksgiving and a recognition of where all this comes from. In First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12, he starts, he says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give thanks and praise for your glorious name. But you, but who am I and who are your people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. And then in verse 16 of that same prayer, he says, Lord, our God, all of this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. Trusting that God will provide for our need, even when it's difficult to do it. But that's a part of commitment. It's commitment to be able to, to wait on God even when he's not responding to our cries in the way that we want him to. It's trusting God because he has a track record for doing so, such things and doing amazing things for us. So let's go back to Psalm 145, verses 1 to 3. Look at the number of times that, that, that um, David uses words that, that resound in praise. Exalt you. Praise your name. I will praise you and I will extol your name forever and ever. He is worthy, most worthy, he says, of praise. So Trish and I were talking about this sermon and I was kind of bouncing some ideas off of her. And she left a note for me yesterday. Um, and it's from this book. It's called True Worshippers. And I really wish that, that I had thought of this myself, because it makes perfect sense. What are some of the things, I'm just going to ask you, you just shout them out, okay? What are some things that you associate with worship? God. Besides God. Okay, God, yeah. Music? Prayer? prayer communion? communion scripture. scripture? Right? So we think of all those things, we think of it in terms of this worship service or maybe what we do um, on our own time, right? In our own personal time. And all that stuff is worshipful. But one of the things that drew out from this book was that our trust is an act of worship. Our obedience to God and his commands is an act of worship. 
You know, because when we look at these words here, and we see we see what Paul or we see what David is saying here that these are acts of worship that I want to extol your name, I want to praise you, I want to I want to live a life that that resembles praise. And a life that resembles praise is a life that resembles praise, not a moment, not just a moment, but a life. So when we are obedient to the words of God, when we are obedient to the goodness, to, to, to his commands and all of that, then, then we, are, we are actually worshiping God. We're saying that your, what you want me to do is more important than I, what I want to do. When we, when we trust God and we are saying to God, then this is my act of worship to you. I am trusting you to meet my needs. I am, I am trusting you to hear me. I am trusting you to be with me even when I don't understand your delay. So trust truly is an act of worship. Colossians 3.17 And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Trust is earned. God has certainly earned it. And he's certainly worthy of it. Father, thank you so much for Reminding us that you are a God who is worthy of trust. And so now we now we have to show you that we believe it. So Lord, I pray for you to intervene in our hearts and in our minds to be willing to recognize how great you are. To be willing to recognize that you can be trusted. God, help us to worship you in trust and obedience. Help us, God, to respond in this moment to you because you are certainly worthy of it and you've certainly earned it. Thank you for seeing us, for knowing us, for loving us. Thank you for seeing our mess and for loving us anyway. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for that mess. So I pray that we would walk out of it and trust you to change us, to make us more like you. In this moment, Lord, we just give ourselves to you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.